Hey guys, this is Lawrence of the Ketones and Coffee Podcast. Make sure to subscribe down below so you don't miss out on any of this great content. Hey guys, this is Lawrence. So welcome back to the Ketones and Coffee Podcast and thank you so much for tuning in. I know everyone here that's listening are here because you want to create a sustainable, healthy lifestyle through the ketogenic diet. And every single week, I try to bring in guests that not only has knowledge, but these individuals has also been through the same trials that we all have been through when it comes down to our search for a better health. We get together in hopes to assist you on your own journey. So excited for this, guys. Our guest today is a nutritional therapy consultant, and she is the creator behind MadelineEvergreen.com in which she shares wellness tips, healthy recipes that are keto and diabetic friendly, and so much more to help teach people that struggles to find their way back to health. She is also the host of the Project Keto Podcast, a podcast that teaches the how-tos, practical tips, and tactics to eat keto long-term. I'm so excited for this. I'm here with Madeline Evergreen. Madeline, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you on. I'm glad you're here to share your story. Um, I read something you wrote that I love so much. And you said, I want to start the show with this. You wouldn't be as successful in helping other people if it weren't for your own health struggles. You know, I, I, I believe that I commend that so much because I believe that telling real stories is has the unique impact to all of us especially to our listeners today um to that are seeking you know a better way of living so i'm glad to have you on and uh yeah thank you for coming on and you know willing to share your story and when i uh reached out to you um you were so eager to to come on and share your story to our listeners so i'm i'm so happy to to have you on here today yeah, it's funny um, when you said that what I wrote, um, I think back to um, what I was like growing up. I, I had no interest in being anything to do with health care or wellness or nutrition and definitely mm -hmm. nothing to do with science at all. Mm -hmm. But I kind of was um, forced into this based off of my own health struggles and my challenges finding anybody to help me that I just ended up having to learn it myself. So here I am. And now I, I love science. I love nutrition. I love health. And I never thought that this would be the path I would be taking. I love when you said that because I am the same. I am really not somebody that, you know, if you, if you look back um, when I was in high school or college, I really never, never really thought about nutrition as much as until when I was exper experiencing my own health struggles and um, that's why I really resonated with that statement so much because we are really in a journey that we are on right now and we we take it as it is or maybe we choose to ignore it and so i'd like to tell your story right here because you your health struggle started at a very early age um you talked about having digestive issues since you were a baby uh, mm -hmm. we'll talk about that in a second you also had talked about growth hormone issues where your body stopped producing hormones altogether growth hormones altogether so you had to take injections to reach a normal height. Then when yeah. you got to high school by senior year, that's when you had removed a lot of the um, unwanted stuff on your diet, including gluten, dairy, and sugar, total abstinence from there. Um, take us back when you had first experienced your digestive issues that you were experiencing the earliest you can remember you know leading up to your total abstinence from sugar gluten and dairy sure so um i'll go back even further than when i can remember um and it was my very first full sentence as a little i don't know baby or toddler and i said my knees hurt mm. and my parents you know realized that I had knee pain. 
And I had all kinds of joint pain as a child, um, you know, a teenager, not so much now, but mm -hmm. growing up, that was one of my worst symptoms. I had just had so much joint pain. And then I had tons of digestive problems. I was one of those kids that was always throwing up, you know, just spontaneously vomiting or having such severe stomach pain. There was countless times in the night where I would wake up as a little kid and my parents would consider, should we go to the ER? Should mm. we call 911? And then all of a sudden that it was bad. gone. Mm. Yeah, it was that bad where I was severely in pain and then it would just go away like mm -hmm. in a in a few minutes and it would come and go like that and um and this went on oh yeah this mm -hmm. was like my whole life mm -hmm. you know i never i can't people often will ask like when was the last time that you um you know felt like you had really good health like sometimes people will ask that on health intake forms and mm -hmm. it's like oh well i guess now i mean never i've never had that where i felt like i had consistently good health mm -hmm. any time in my past um maybe for like a few hours but i really struggled and then i was also so so short um people almost always thought that i was half my age so if i was eight people thought i was four mm -hmm. you know um I had to get like a really tiny violin when I was in orchestra and like I was just so, so small, but it was still the point where people just think like, oh, you know, you're a kid, you'll have a growth spurt or you're a late bloomer or you're just petite. But my mom knew better and she knew something was wrong because I hadn't grown at all for years and you know when you're just a short person you still grow but you just grow slowly but I had like a stopping point on my growth chart so after many years of her badgering the doctors to look into this they finally did um, they just wouldn't do it I don't know why I mean maybe it's inconvenient maybe it costs them a lot but I ended up getting um, a lot of testing done one day in the hospital to find out why I wasn't growing and discovered that I was not producing growth hormone, which is mm. shocking that yeah. the doctors had no interest at all in looking into that. And sure enough, it was a really big deal. Mm. And so um, I got onto growth hormone injections and luckily I was able to grow and now I'm almost mm -hmm. five foot two and that's great. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. wonderful. And um, all those years, my mom would ask these doctors, why isn't she producing growth hormone? And then also what's going to happen when she stops taking injections? Like mm -hmm. do adults need growth hormone, even though they're not growing taller? And then the doctors didn't know the answers, but they also just didn't really find that an interesting or useful question. So my experience with the medical industry growing up was mm. very, very negative. I always felt uh, unseen, unheard. I always felt like they would either laugh at my questions or they would just brush them off as silly. What and were what were the questions that were you were asking? Oh, well, just so simple ones like, why am I not producing growth hormone? Mm -hmm. I mean, they they just thought, why would you ever ask that question? Mm -hmm. And they acted as if it was a stupid question mm -hmm. um, or, you know, what's going to happen as an adult? Do adults produce growth hormone? Do I need to take injections as an adult? And they would laugh and they thought that was ridiculous because adults don't grow. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure why that was so ridiculous, because it's pretty easy to just look up and find out that mm -hmm. adults do produce growth hormone. That's just, it's used in ways that isn't for height, mm -hmm. but you, you do grow, you grow muscles, you grow, all, you grow skin, mm -hmm. you grow all kinds of things. And it's an, it's a hormone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then other questions I would have, like, uh, I don't know, I can't think of any specific ones, but I, I just grew up with a really negative experience. Anytime I was in the doctor's office, it was just so unpleasant and it felt so useless. Mm -hmm. So by the time I was a teenager and I was still having health problems where I was vomiting all the time, not from bulimia, but just 
spontaneous vomiting. Mm. Uh, I always looked kind of puffy. I was never one of those really lean people with a lot of muscle tone. Mm. And I grew up as an athlete and a dancer and an aerialist. And so I was kind of wondering, like, how come everybody else is so thin? How come everybody else Mm. has like a six pack? And I'm just sort of, I wasn't fat, but I was just sort of puffy all the time. And no matter what I did, I just couldn't Mm. be fit looking. And I also had like fainting. I would faint often where at school they would have to call 911 all the Mm. time on me because I'd be passing out or vomiting. And I didn't know why. Yeah. So my senior year of high school, A friend of mine and I had heard of like, maybe gluten is a problem. Mm. I mean, this was long enough ago. This was, I don't know, 12 years ago now, maybe 13 years ago that we heard of this thing, gluten, and it it wasn't popular at the time, you know, um, the gluten-free aisle at the grocery store was like five inches wide. You know, it wasn't Mm. really a thing people knew about. And so we heard about gluten and thought that maybe for both of us, it would be good to give that up. So I tried and it took me an entire year to go more than a couple of hours without eating gluten or Mm. sugar or dairy. And I would sneak it like I would sneak some croutons or I would go in the kitchen when everybody else was in the living room and I would like put a, you know, I would eat like a Mm. piece of cereal or something because I felt like if I don't have like a hit of gluten, I am going to have like a psychotic break or I'm going to have a massive meltdown or I would be kind of shaky Mm -hmm. and looking um, excuse me, looking back into it now, I, I now understand gluten is actually an addictive substance in your brain Mm -hmm. and you get a morphine like effect from gluten. And what I was doing was going in the kitchen and basically, um, you know, taking drugs, Mm -hmm. but in gluten form, you, you give yourself this pleasure response in your brain every time you eat gluten. And it's the same thing with dairy. It's just a different type of pleasure response that, and I, I just could not get off of those foods. I literally couldn't do it until I learned about brain amino acids or neurotransmitters. And I was able to get on some targeted amino acids. And then within just a couple of minutes of taking my very first set of amino acids, I never had a gluten problem again, not one Mm. time. And I just, when I work with clients now, I almost won't meet with somebody until they get onto some specific amino acids before our appointment. Because I find that when I do meet with someone fresh out of the gate, and they're coming from a standard American diet, they can't actually even pay attention in the appointment. (laughs) So they are, they have brain fog, Mm -hmm. they are all wrapped up in their Mm -hmm. emotional connection to foods, and they get upset when we're talking. And, and it's nothing that's shocking or out of the ordinary, but I found like, oh, wow, in, in the past, our first appointment is always so frustrating because Mm. they are overwhelmed or they're upset at hearing that they might have to change certain foods. And then they're having emotional responses. And then they also forget what I'm saying because they have brain fog. And then Mm. it's just kind of an emotional roller coaster until they go off and they start taking some of these amino acids. And then the appointments Mm. moving forward are so fantastic. So I've found, I just have to tell people, you know, before we meet, why don't you start taking some of these things and don't even change your diet just start taking them and then they come to their appointment and they have like a clear mind Mm. they can focus sometimes they've already just started removing certain foods from their diet because it's just habitual once you get the neurotransmitters going and so um i've just learned that that is almost universally uh required for Mm -hmm. people to change Wow, <laughs> there's so much there. Um, first of all, what I get from what you were talking about earlier about um, finding out about gluten is you've grown frustrated um, to keeping going going to the doctors, uh, but they seem to you know d- not do anything or brush you off or even you know, laugh at your questions. Um, so you were 
somebody that was frustrated in the system so you had to take matters into your own hands is that is that uh is that accurate absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely it's accurate and you know even beyond what i explained about the gluten and all that mm -hmm. in high school i i mean i've spent the last i'm 31 now and i'm still my own best doctor mm -hmm. not to toot my own horn yeah. i think everybody should be their own best doctor but i still have spent the last 12 years since then mm -hmm. or 10 years whatever it is i don't know but i've spent all this time through my 20s and even now where i am researching every day i'm trying things i am learning i'm reading mm -hmm. and i find that really to have your best health you have to take it into your own hands and of course use practitioners use therapies use people to help but i i've learned that just mm -hmm. expecting to go to an appointment and have somebody give me all the answers is never going to be mm -hmm. ideal so why why is some why why is some people um sensitive to foods like gluten and dairy is that uh genetic or is that something that uh you can develop well gluten and dairy are specific foods that are addictive and mm. so you say sensitive and yes some people are more sensitive than others but i don't believe that mm. anybody should be consuming yeah. gluten unless it's in its original form mm. because gluten has been genetically modified so that mm. now it has got it different proteins that the human body doesn't recognize mm. so in the 1980s i'm in minneapolis and here at the u of m the university of minnesota somebody in the 1980s decided to genetically modify wheat and it changed and people's mm. people can't digest that and so i don't even believe that somebody has a sensitivity or somebody doesn't it's like yeah should you eat plastic should mm. you eat styrofoam mm -hmm. no those mm. aren't foods for people yeah. to be eating yeah so i don't believe that our form of gluten now is something that people even mm. can digest properly now if you went way back to einkorn wheat or some other kind of original form of wheat i would bet that a lot of people would digest that better if it's soaked and sprouted and it's properly prepared mm. um but it's nothing like the bread that we have now and then dairy I believe that some people do okay or even thrive with raw dairy from 100% grass fed cows in moderation. And I believe that that's the dairy that is better because that's mm. how dairy is actually mm. in a natural form. That's its closest to nature. If you go and adulterate the dairy by pasteurizing it or by getting dairy from a sick cow that's been fed corn or gmos then that is not food either that's not something that mm -hmm. people should be putting in their bodies so it's not to me a matter of sensitivity it's just understanding is that real food or is that fake food mm -hmm. but then even with the raw dairy you know a lot of people don't tolerate that well um partially because that casein casein is one of the proteins in dairy and when you eat casein it's changed into something called caseomorphins and that gives you a morphine like response and it's addictive so that's why nobody can just eat like one slice of cheese and then they feel really satisfied and they never think about cheese again you know most people overeat dairy and it's just kind of a cascading thing but i do believe that some people tolerate mm. raw 100 percent grass-fed dairy okay mm. i i want to I want for my listeners to be able to maybe diagnose themselves, right? You know, obviously in your experience, um, you had to do that for yourself um, because it's really, cause I want to ask you this first, when you do go to your doctors and you talk about all of your symptoms that's happening, all your digestive issues, where do where do they point you to? Do they prescribe medications to you? Do they ask what you eat? What what's what's the protocol there? Well, that's a little bit hard for me to remember because I haven't mm -hmm. been to the doctor since I was probably thirteen or fourteen. Mm -hmm. um, I've been to urgent care once mm -hmm. since then, but that's it. 
And but what I do remember is I would say things that like a teenager would say, like, why am I fat? Mm. And I wasn't fat, but I thought that I was because I didn't look like other kids mm. who were just normal teenagers that yep. were gangly. Yep. I looked really like mm. uh, not I, I didn't look fat, but I, I was a robust mm -hmm. person. Like mm -hmm. I was strong and I was a little bit puffy and I had like kind of like baby fat mm -hmm. on me. And then the doctors would just tell me it's all in my head. Mm. or that I'm I'm being too harsh on myself or that I should mm. just cut calories. I had one person tell me I should do yoga and stop mm. lifting weights. There's... I was lifting weights as a kid. My whole life I've list lifted weights. And and what a ridiculous thing to say. He said I could stretch out my muscles mm. and they would be longer instead of bulking up really? by lifting weights. And I just think, "Wow, what a dumb thing to say." <laughs> they're, they're almost saying but... it's normal. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And and to tell a child, you know, you're being too hard on yourself by saying that you're fat. Mm. I think I, I, in, that was the wrong thing to tell me because you're completely disregarding my true emotions mm. and my deepest insecurities. Yeah. And I think it's OK for children to go to their parents or go to their close friends or go to their doctors or whoever is taking care of their health and be honest and mm -hmm. say things mm -hmm. like, why do I look like this? Or what is this symptom? Mm -hmm. And not to tell them to stop feeling that way, but to talk to them about it. Mm. Like maybe if somebody had actually just talked to me and said, like, you're very muscular, you know, that's why you don't fit into a size double zero mm. jeans. You are really strong. And I didn't know that. I And I just thought I was large. Mm. And I... I just I constantly was being told either it doesn't matter or you're making that up or lo just exercise more and eat less. Mm. It was always those things that yeah. would come out of the doctor's mouth. And then eventually I just stopped going because me and my family felt like it wasn't helping. But then I did I did go to all kinds of other practitioners. So I've been to, you know, um, natural health type of people, chiropractors, all kinds of people. And I found that a lot of times I still don't get very useful answers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do, but it wasn't until like the internet exploded and there was all these podcasts and all these summits and then all these books I would find mm -hmm. from those where I would just, I've spent hours and hours listening to these interviews where I finally would get a piece of the puzzle and then I can go and seek out that type of practitioner or that type of treatment. So for example, SIBO, mm -hmm. that's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Mm -hmm. That's something that I heard about on a summit that was like a digestive summit or whatever, where they put out a whole bunch of interviews every day for a week. And you just basically binge listen to all these experts. And it was amazing. And I learned so much. And then I was, I was convinced I had SIBO, which I did, but at the time I hadn't been tested, but I learned all about SIBO. I knew that I had it. And so I went and found a SIBO specialist here in Minneapolis. And I paid like $500 for this appointment. And I was probably 23. And it was honestly the worst appointment I've ever gone to in my life. Mm. It was, I was crying when I walked out the door because I just spent $500 and this woman didn't know anything about SIBO. And I spent the last week learning about it, this on a summit. And I swear I knew 10 times more than her. Mm. It was shocking. She, I'm not even going to go into it, but just because somebody is an expert in something or because they have a degree, it doesn't mean that they're good at working mm, with people mm. or working with that issue. Yeah. So I left from that um, feeling like I just had to take it into my own hands. So I learned how to order a SIBO breath test. I learned how to interpret the results. I learned how to treat it depending on your results. And I took myself through the entire treatment and I did all of it on my own based off of my research and it worked. And since then I've learned a lot more that I could have done better. Um, but it actually worked and I'm a lot healthier because of it. And now I've, I've found lots of SIBO practitioners now mm -hmm. are doing what I learned. And it's not because of anything I've said, I haven't really like gone out and shared what I did, but I I'm confirmed that what I did was correct. 
um, just based off of seeing how popular SIBO treatments are now. You're looking in the wrong places in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, you're look. You're, now you're looking at the right places where people are digging to digging into the right science. Well, I want to commend you on really taking it upon yourself because some people would have, you know, the same type of issues, but really won't take any type of action maybe because they're scared of um not staying the same or getting out of their comfort zone or not eating uh other types of food that they uh, they're accustomed to having and so i really just want to commend people in general that are taking matters into their own hands It, it looks like you were Somebody that's not going to stop until they find the answer. Um, looking to places, trying trial and error, look, uh, going into um, specialists, talking to specialists. And, you know, if you don't find what you're looking for, you're going to look someplace else that will. Right. So I, I just want to commend people that are that way and that are, that are not um, stopping until they get the right answer. But it, well, thank you. Yeah, it feels yeah. like you you were somebody that's uh, really aware of what you're feeling. Go ahead. Yeah, and that's something, if I um, can, I'd like to just touch on that because my entire life until the last maybe two years, I have always been convinced that I have severe health problems, worse than most people. And now I don't think that's true at all. I think mm. that I'm pretty much the same as everybody Um, everybody now in our world has severe health problems unless they take extraordinary measures. And I think that what's different about me is that I'm extremely sensitive and I hate Mm. feeling bad. Like I hate feeling sick. I hate not being like at a hundred percent. And I literally feel like I cannot do anything if I have like one tiny mm. symptom and I know that might seem extreme, but it's just, no, just being no, honest. I'm very sensitive. Yeah, no, yeah, I get what you mean. <laughs> I get what you mean. I, whenever, <laughs> and it always reminds me when I go off track, it, it always reminds me because it takes me a couple of days to get out of that funk. Yeah. It takes me a couple of days and I would be, my symptoms are going to be, for example, um, I will be, I will start my day going, going back on track by fasting <laughs> to just fast track my, uh, mm-hmm. my way into ketosis. Right. But that the, the first couple of days is the worst days for me because it, I will be so, first of all, hungry, craving for hours and those were the days, hours, minutes that I make the the worst decisions ever in my entire life. And so mm-hmm. it oh I always get get reminded whenever I would go off track that is this worth it? You know, the last time you did it, this happened to you. And I that's why I get what you're saying so much is people that are like us who's looks for answers is because we feel like what the expert quote unquote expert what they told us isn't the right answers because we feel different we mm-hmm. want to feel good and this is not good right we mm-hmm. follow what we feel the most credible people i like like you mentioned before where you went to that specialist about SIBO is, in my opinion, to talk about reversing any type of health issue is the person who has figured out how to overcome it holistically without any dependence on prescription. Somebody that listens to their body and make changes to their diets according to how they feel are the people that are most credible for me. Like, let's say somebody that has reversed their type 2 diabetes is the person that is most credible for reversing that issue. What did they do? What steps did they take? 
who are the people that they listen to and healing their body holistically without any dependence on prescriptions, I think is somebody that is most credible for me. That's why you coaching other people about finding their own health, you know, having your own experience and what you said in the beginning about just um, if you didn't have the experience, you didn't, you won't be as successful as educating people today is so key to yeah. this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, that all of that is so true. And um, this past school year, mm-hmm. I've been teaching a homeschooled nutrition course for teenagers. And this mm-hmm. is the first time that I've worked with teenagers on their health. And it is super interesting. Um, I absolutely love it because these kids are they're so open Mm -hmm. to information and they just want to know how things work and what the truth is and they don't have very much um like Mm -hmm. personal offense to that oftentimes when working with adults if you say something like the truth about gluten they'll get very offended because mm. they've been eating it their whole life. And they're, they start having this like ego attack yeah. where they feel bad because they didn't know and they eat it all the time and they don't want to give it up. You know, they kind of go round and yeah. round, but with the teenagers I've found, they're just like, I love wow, this. I love why this. did that happen? Oh, oh, mm. wow. And they just keep asking questions like why, why, yeah. why? But in a teenager type of way. And it's very, it's just so interesting. I didn't know that's what it would be like. Mm-hmm. And, What else is really interesting is that I found that almost none of them have actually made any changes themselves Mm -hmm. this past year. And they're not required to. I've decided I'm not even going to have any expectations on anybody Mm -hmm. to do anything other than they know they're supposed to show up for class and do the assignments Mm -hmm. and take the tests. But they don't have to apply anything to their life. And I I decided Mm -hmm. to do that because, well, you can't can't force people to change. But also the very first stage of change and transformation is just hearing or learning information before actually making a step. And so what I'm, I've been working on instilling in them much deeper than just nutrition information is that they are in charge of their entire life Mm. beyond just health. But we just always talk about health. That's the topic of the class. But the truth is, is that the biggest benefit they get from the class is learning that they are in charge of their whole Mm. life and they get to decide what's going to happen and how things are going to go, you know, within whatever they have control of. And it's been very, very interesting Mm. to see them taking charge of their actions, taking charge of their decisions and being more accountable for themselves rather than, the beginning of the year started out with everybody just saying, well, I have ADD, Mm -hmm. so I can't do that or I have to do this. And now they're understanding that, you know, that's okay if they have that issue. And then now what, what do you want to do with that? I love this so much for kids that want to learn about right, the right nutrition. Now they have that resources to do so kids who want, to learn about this can now learn about it because you know what's funny most of the people that i talk to that are into fitness into nutrition um when we talk about going back to their teenage years when when they do start when when they were athletes uh when they were teenagers most of them are learning nutrition for from bodybuilding.com it's mostly, mm. the, which is the mostly the wrong information. I'm not mm. knocking bodybuilding.com. It's just kids are finding them for nutrition. That's my problem, mm-hmm. right? So I talk about, you know, being proactive with your health. You know, that's why I love this idea of, you know, starting the younger generation to learn about, you know, nutrition and the effects of nutrition to their bodies. And you touch upon, like, kids are more open to information know about their health their bodies and how everything works it i i uh i i always talk about that because i that's why that's what i observe with them and they they're just so open to anything 
that may help them um, b- because the older generation are you know it's a lot harder for them to make changes because of what was you know their conditioning or maybe you know they've been doing it you know all their life right yeah um i didn't know anything about nutrition i just back then i just follow what everyone was doing which was chicken and broccoli if i do want to shed weight Mm -hmm. and then now back to back to that old diet which is the standard making diet i'm in total agreement with you about this and i think it's great and we should teach them but for you i want to ask you um i know you touched upon some some points about why this is important but why do you specifically why do you think it is important to teach them as early as possible Mm, because i think that they i think that the types of things that you learn Mm -hmm. that make an impact on you as a child or teenager they oftentimes will stick Mm -hmm. in your subconscious forever yeah and that do you ever look back on the past and think like, Oh, I'll never forget that one thing that that teacher said, or that I learned at camp or whatever it is, something that was really impactful for you, but you never acted on it, Mm -hmm. but it actually changed your entire life. And it, it kind of came to you later. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that it's okay if nobody makes any diet changes, Mm -hmm. you know, this year or right now, even though all of them are struggling But I know that a lot of this information is going to buzz in the back of their mind for a long time. And I think that's really valuable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I believe that. It's it's the same with financial literacy. I don't think Mm -hmm. kids will will, will find out how important it is at that time, right? But Mm -hmm. it is something that they may go back to as they grow older. It's the same yeah. thing, I think. I believe. I, I love. I love what you're doing, and for for kids that are actually like, if we go back to what you were experiencing in high school, if you had something like this back then, it wouldn't take you this long or until until you were senior in senior year to make changes, right? Exactly. For kids, even if it's one kid out of yeah. out of the whole school that's looking yeah. for a change now that kid will have information right that they he or she can diagnose themselves with even if it's one person out of the whole school mm-hmm. right that's experiencing what you have experienced back in in back when you were in high school it's so helpful for that kid it wouldn't take that kid uh years to figure this out yeah exactly and i remember when i was in high school i went to a performing arts high school and i was there for dance and they brought in a nutritionist Mm. and looking back on it now i think that the reason they brought this person in was to convince people not to be anorexic Mm -hmm. i mean because a lot of dancers are or they have eating disorders i i wasn't but they brought this person in and she gave the worst advice ever. She would say things like, oh, it's better to have candy and pop for breakfast than nothing. Hmm? And then I would, I was very outspoken and I would raise my hand and say like, I don't think that's true. I mean, having sugar, that sounds like really bad (laughs) to start your day with that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about intermittent fasting, but I just thought that's a stupid thing to say. And I would pretty much just, tell the teacher that and I would get in so much trouble all the time for speaking out like that but mm. yeah it would yeah. it really would have changed my life and also the other people in the class who did have eating disorders if we had all learned how mm-hmm. to fuel our bodies properly and care for ourselves maybe we wouldn't all have so many problems I'm so happy for kids nowadays now like kids that really want to you know figure out what's happening within their bodies because you were somebody that's been experiencing digestive issues you know ever since you were little (laughs) and if you had this you it wouldn't you know it it would really help you and if it if someone is really struggling right now 
at that early age, then, you know, even if it's, again, if it's one person out of the whole school, then, you know, <laughs> you're doing your job. Um, so I, I love that. Where can they, where can they sign up for that? Yeah, well, right now the class is only in person mm -hmm. and this last year I've been talking a lot about it on my social media and mm -hmm. I've had a, an alarming amount of people reach out to me and say, where can I sign up my child for this? Like, take my money, mm -hmm. I'm in. And they tell me that there are zero classes like this mm -hmm. for homeschooled students. And I mean, I'm assuming also students that go to school, but yep. um, most of these people are homeschooled parents that reach out to me. But they say like the only health credit that they can sign up their child for is like standard American diet classes or dietitian led classes or classes about the food pyramid. And they're all awful. And these parents like flocked to this class because they said, I try to eat this way, but my child doesn't listen to me or they don't want to do what I'm doing. Mm. And so they need to learn it from somebody else. So um, since I've had so many people reach out online, I am actually creating an online version of the class, which mm. is so exciting. I love that teaching makes sense. groups and I love teaching that online. Yeah. yeah. And so right now people can get on the wait list to be notified mm. when it's ready to sign up for. So you awesome. can um, find the link. Maybe you'll post it, but it's also on my um, social media. If you just ever go mm -hmm. to my Instagram and find the link in my bio, you can just get your your name and email in there so that you can be notified when the class is open and it should be pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And this is a class for homeschooled students, but also any other teenagers or college age students, and they don't have to be homeschooled. Um, it's it's really anybody mm -hmm. in that age range, though. We're, we're going to link it uh, in the description down below so you guys can look it up. Um, Perfect. This is the topic that I'm most excited about shamanic breadwork so just mm. just recently actually a couple of months ago incorporated breathing uh into my routine um and i didn't think i could elevate my days a lot more um but with breathing i can feel the difference right after a session like but quick note my you know everybody knows about this they already know this looking at keto as a diet but rather a lifestyle then anything that is part of your lifestyle has a direct effect to what you're trying to accomplish. So I'm saying that because, you know, breathing is part of my lifestyle and it helps me, you know, gain energy or um, if I'm feeling uh, like a brain fog is coming, it's something that I do uh, in the morning a couple, and before bed, you, you know, it's something that if you if I don't do, I'm gonna struggle to stay consistent. And so if if your diet is on point, but you're not in the right headspace, uh, you're you're gonna struggle to stay consistent. I believe in breath work. In fact, you know, like I said, I do them uh, religiously, and it's really affected my days. And I usually do them uh, twice a day, and even before the interview, <laughs> I do them. <laughs> Th mm -hmm. This is so important, and I want to learn about this type of breathing. So having said that, let's start with defining what shamanic breathwork is and its benefits. Shamanic breathwork is typically not what anybody expects or thinks that it is. Um, it's called shamanic breathwork because it, shamanic simply means that you are your own best healer. Mm. And you can go within for all the answers. So it's not, sometimes people are afraid of the word shamanic and they think that it means something like black magic, but mm -hmm. it's nothing like that. It just is implying that you are, you've got all the answers. You're the healer. And shamanic breath work is a, it's a whole process that you do. Um, typically it's nothing like doing breathing exercises. Mm -hmm. Like you would not do shamanic breath work before you're going to do an interview, but maybe you would do something like Wim Hof breathing or box mm -hmm. breathing or a different type of breath work for, you know, changing your nervous system. Shamanic breath work is kind of like doing an ayahuasca trip mm -hmm. or a little bit like doing mushrooms, but with no substances. You use the breath and you use music as the vehicle to bring you into an altered state. So 
I love it. It is so incredible. Um, I've done a lot personally. That's actually what I had to do about 10 years ago in order to like truly get on this healing train. I was so miserable and so lost and so depressed that I, I really did have to go away for a month to the mountains. And I did this month long shamanic breath work retreat that changed my entire personality and my whole life. And now I lead breath works. I do little tiny ones and I do long retreats. I do all different kinds of um, mm. breath work events, but basically how it works is that you're sitting or you're lying down on your little spot on the floor with some pillows and blankets and this music comes on that is very loud and it isn't relaxing music it's oftentimes like tribal or drumming or kind of loud intense music with strong beats and you go into this um, powerful breath where you're inhaling in your nose and exhaling out through your mouth and it's a little bit fast. It's not um, hyperventilating, but it's there's no stopping like you pause at the top or the bottom. You just inhale, mm. exhale, inhale, exhale, and it's pretty deep and 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 physical. Sometimes people are rocking or moving or kind of moving their arms with the breath, and you you do this breathing until you're surprised. That's just what they say. And usually when you're in it, you know what that means. But if you haven't done it, usually that phrase doesn't make any sense. But surprised could mean all of a sudden you're having a massive emotional release or all of a sudden you are having visions or you've exited, you know, the room and you are in some other world or you are on mm. some kind of journey or you're receiving messages or downloads from some other realm. And so it really is a, an altered state that you get into with the breath and the music. And the music is actually designed to vibrate with your chakras from your base chakra up to your crown chakra in order. So that it kind of goes through an evolution and you have a whole entire cellular shift from this breath and from the music. And it can last any amount of time. You could do a shamanic breath work for five minutes. You could do it for a few hours, but um, it's different depending on what you are signing up mm -hmm. for. And then typically there will be a lot of um, integration exercises afterwards. So you'll go right away and do an artwork process and then a journaling process and then a sharing process with the group. And those processes can go on for, you know, an hour total or I've done ones where we're doing this for a week mm. and it's super deep and in depth. It's not talk therapy at all, but a lot of it is where you're sharing and you're, um, you know, you're talking, but you're not having therapy. So it's pretty powerful. It's pretty uncomfortable and it makes people, um, it's usually not fun mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at all but it's incredibly life-changing and impactful and amazing. I just absolutely love it. Who is it for? Like what, what type of benefits have you seen? Um, the most incredible benefits that you've seen from somebody or yourself that you've experienced. Um, and, and who is this for? Well, this is for people who are struggling mm -hmm. in any capacity. Um, but people that, Maybe you're trying at something in your life, whether it's your health or your, mm -hmm. your, your relationships, your anything, and it's not working and you, you don't really like what's going on with you and you need a shift. Mm. And so by doing shamanic breath work, you can have a lot of release and a lot of it can be emotional release. A lot of it is energetic. A lot. It's just, it's, it's a lot. But mm -hmm. one thing that's always good for people to remember that emotions are just energy in motion. Mm -hmm. And if you experienced a trauma emotionally, so maybe you were a little kid and you fell down and mm -hmm. that was very traumatic and you cried and had a lot of emotion around that. Well, as an adult, maybe you look back and don't even remember it, or you thought that was just silly that you cried and mm -hmm. it's no, no big deal. But the truth is, is that you had a trauma that was emotional and now that's stuck in your body unless you do something about that. And so when people have emotional releases, whether it's in breath work or something else, you are 
moving that traumatic emotion that's trapped in your body out. So something mm -hmm. that enters you emotionally can only exit you emotionally. So in these breath works, people will usually cry mm -hmm. or they might scream or have a lot of emotional release. And they're not just lying flat and doing this in your head. It's typically looks and sounds just like a ta temper tantrum. Mm. And you just let it rip, you let it out, and then you've shifted. And so I think, you know, breath work is a really, really great place for people who are feeling stuck and they can't figure out why. And no matter what you do, isn't really working because you can't do your way out of trauma. Mm. You have to actually process the trauma. And oftentimes talk therapy also doesn't work for people. Mm. Maybe it, it works a little bit, but it doesn't really get you fully released. Mm. And so by letting yourself go there and, and just move stuff out, usually you don't even know what it is that's coming out. You don't know why you're having these emotions, but you're just having them. It all comes out and you are different, but then you have to go and do the work. So the biggest mistake that I see people make with breath work is that they go off and they think that the work was just by going to the retreat or the event mm. and that's it. But no, you have to go out now and you have to be a new person. And mm. so that's why you go through all of those integration exercises, the talking and the writing and the artwork and all of this, because you are meant to go off now and integrate what just happened into your life. Mm. So like for me, when I first went to this month long breath work, I went in there a very angry, very angry, depressed person. And then I left with tools for what to do moving forward. And I really did apply them. Mm -hmm. I went off into my life and I applied them and I, and it was uncomfortable and I did have to change. And it was, it felt inauthentic to me because it was inauthentic because I'm changing. I'm becoming a different person and it worked. And I, I continue to do the work and I continue to do these types of practices a lot. And so I would say breath work is for people who are struggling and who are stuck and don't know what else to do, but they're also people who are willing to go off and put in the work mm. and be uncomfortable. It's not for people who want a quick mm. fix. I love it. Um, where is it? Is this online or is this um, in person? Right now, it's only in person. Mm -hmm. um, it's something I think about a lot about doing online, but I just can't. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine that that would be as great of an mm -hmm. experience, yep. but it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's listening that wants, you know, wants that, just stay in touch and maybe mm -hmm. I'll be offering it online at some point, or you can reach out and ask if that's something you want. But right now it's just local here in my studio in Minneapolis. Um, and we, the, the person that I facilitate with Lisa and I, we may be doing some international retreats as well. We might mm -hmm. be going to Mexico at some point and offering retreats. And so I encourage people to just stay in touch, even if you're not going to come to Minneapolis. Awesome. And um, do you also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching online for uh, nutrition? And Yeah. Yes, I do. And very, very rarely though, um, at this point, I've learned so much about myself that I mm. love groups. I'm mm. really, really good with working with groups. And so a lot of what I do is that, but I will still work with some clients one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's in person or online. And so if you're interested in that, you can reach out to me. There's nowhere on my website to apply for that or anything, because I really do only work with specific types of people. But anybody can just email me or reach out if that's something that they want, and we'll see if it's a good fit. So MadelineEvergreen.com, correct? Yes. We're going to link it down below, guys, so you guys can check it out. I had a blast. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story, Madeline. Um, I am so grateful for you. Thank you for being um, so uh, gracious with your time, and uh, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This was just really, really fun <laughs> for me. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Madeline. Yep. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too.